A huge change for the Starship program is coming up. A new expansion plan for Starbase has been laid out, including many things like upgrades to the current facility and a bunch of new structures that we've never heard of before. So let's explore this plan and see what it's all about. First, the upgraded plans for Starbase's launch site reveal some interesting details about the two launch pads, now referred to as Pad 1 and Pad 2, rather than the previous designations of Pad A and B. You can see the two pads in the blue colored area. This represents the part of the site that currently exists. The white areas show the planned extensions, which we'll discuss later. With the Block 3 Starship just around the corner, attention is shifting to Pad 2, since Pad 1 will soon become obsolete, as it is not compatible with the new version. So, what upgrades does Pad 2 bring? The most noticeable changes begin with the orbital launch mount, the key structure that supports the Super Heavy booster while it's on the pad. It includes 20 clamps to securely hold the booster in place before liftoff, along with a quick disconnect system that delivers liquid propellant and electrical power. Unlike Pad 1, the Pad 2 OLM does not include 20 individual Raptor quick disconnects for igniting the outer engines. This design change reflects SpaceX's the best part is no part philosophy, reducing complexity, minimizing post-launch inspections, and simplifying refurbishment between flights. Visually and structurally, the Pad 2 mount also differs significantly from Pad 1. While Pad 1 features a donut-shaped design, Pad 2 is a larger, cuboid-shaped structure with a central circular cutout for booster integration. Sitting atop this mount is a water-cooled steel plate, similar in function to the one at Pad 1, but located on the top deck rather than underneath. This redesigned placement is expected to improve durability and resilience, particularly as the new Block 3 Starship variant and higher launch cadence place increased demands on infrastructure. Another key improvement of the orbital launch mount is the use of two booster quick disconnects instead of just one, as seen at Pad 1. These dual BQDs appear to be dedicated to separate propellants, liquid oxygen and liquid methane, and are designed to retract more quickly during launch, reducing exposure to engine exhaust and enhancing overall launch safety and turnaround time. Just beneath the launch mount at Pad 2 is an integrated flame trench, a key piece of infrastructure found at many launch sites around the world. For SpaceX's Starship system, this trench is built to be extremely strong and heat resistant. Its main job is to channel the intense exhaust and heat from the Super Heavy booster away from the pad during liftoff, helping to protect the hardware and reduce the need for repairs after each launch. In the center of this trench, directly below the launch mount, is a unique feature, a heavily water-cooled double-sided flame diverter, also called a flame bucket. This is a unique system that plays a critical role in absorbing and deflecting the powerful engine exhaust. Supplying water to this diverter is a system called the Deluge Farm. It works similarly to the one at Pad 1, using high pressure to spray water out through exits on the pad. However, the Pad 2 Deluge system is designed to hold and release much more water, and it's expected to run at higher pressures. According to the official environmental assessment for the Starship program, the Deluge system at Pad 2 could use up to about 422,000 gallons of water each time it's activated whether for a static fire, a launch, or a landing. Even though the total amount of water used is going up, the number of static fires needed before each launch is expected to go down as the system becomes more reliable. During a typical ignition event, most of the water, over 300,000 gallons, is expected to turn into steam. Some of it, around 17,000 gallons, will be captured by the water containment systems on site. The rest, roughly 88,000 gallons, will flow outside the main launch area, either as shallow surface flow, pushed out by pressure, or released as condensation. It's also estimated that around 17% of the total water is used just before the engines ignite, 75% during the actual launch, and the remaining 8% after liftoff or once the engines shut down. These numbers help engineers understand and manage how the system behaves during different phases of a launch. And of course, we can't forget the Pad 2 launch tower. At first glance, it looks very similar to the one at Pad 1, but there are a few key differences. One noticeable change is the design of the launch tower arms, commonly referred to as the chopsticks. These arms are now shorter than the ones on Pad 1. 
SpaceX tested this updated design by successfully catching Booster 12 and Booster 14 closer to the tower on OLM-1, proving that the longer arms used previously aren't necessary. At the moment, only Pad 2's launch tower is capable of catching a starship. This is because its chopsticks have a smaller lip on the landing rails, which is better suited for catching the vehicle during recovery operations. So, what's happening with Pad 1 now? Are they just going to abandon it after the final Block 2 flight? Thankfully, no. If you take another look at the updated plans, Pad 1 is set for a major upgrade. The updated plans indicate that Pad 1 will be reconfigured to support Block 3 Plus launches and even catch attempts. While the existing launch tower is expected to remain, the current orbital launch mount, OLM, will be demolished and replaced with the new OLM design being developed at Pad 2 and LC-39A. A similar flame trench will also be added beneath the pad to safely divert exhaust from the powerful Raptor engines. Now we're getting into the spicy stuff. What exactly is SpaceX planning to build in the Starbase expansion? Looking at the updated plans, we can see a clear tank farm expansion underway. There's a section labeled HEX, which almost certainly refers to heat exchangers. That means new systems will be installed to help manage cryogenic temperatures, likely tied to fuel or methane handling. Alongside that, several blast walls are being added to protect critical infrastructure from Raptor exhaust. For example, one blast wall will shield Pad 1's tank farm from the hot gases exiting one side of the newly designed flame trench. On the other end of the trench, the exhaust is directed toward a road, which means there's no sensitive hardware at risk in that direction. Another blast wall is being added to protect Pad 1's isolation and purging systems, as well as the deflector farm, from the exhaust gases generated by Pad 2's flame trench. Similarly, the same types of systems at Pad 2's tank farm will be shielded by their own set of blast protection. These upgrades aren't just about reusability. They're about building out a more industrial-grade starbase that can support continuous operations at much higher frequencies. But the biggest part of this expansion may be the construction of at least two new facilities designed to liquefy natural gas into LNG, liquefied natural gas, right on site. Since Raptor engines use liquid methane as their primary propellant, having the ability to create LNG locally is a major step forward in autonomy and efficiency. But producing LNG is no small task. The liquefaction process begins with purifying the incoming natural gas. Impurities like water vapor, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and even trace mercury must be removed to avoid ice formation, corrosion, or performance loss in downstream equipment. After purification, the gas must be gradually cooled to around minus 162 degrees Celsius, or minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, which turns it into a liquid. This cooling is typically done using multi-stage refrigeration systems that use different refrigerants at different temperature levels to reduce the gas's temperature in controlled steps. While the exact machinery SpaceX will use is unknown, such systems often include compressors to maintain pressure, turbo expanders to lower the temperature during expansion phases, and cryogenic heat exchangers that allow for efficient thermal transfer between different parts of the cooling process. There may also be complex rectification columns or absorption units that handle final purification steps, especially for removing residual CO2 and drying the gas. Finally, the resulting LNG needs to be stored in insulated cryogenic tanks that can keep it stable at those ultra-cold temperatures. LNG itself is already made up mostly of methane, usually between 85 to 99 percent depending on the source, which makes it an excellent match for the needs of Starship. However, even small amounts of contaminants like carbon dioxide can cause serious issues. So the purification step is just as critical as the cooling process. With this, SpaceX should be able to produce the majority of the three main cryogenic commodities it needs, methane, oxygen, and nitrogen. The plan also includes areas labeled staging pads for both pads one and two. They appear to be located quite far from the actual pads, and it's currently unclear what purpose they will serve. Hopefully, we'll find out soon. As SpaceX accelerates development of its Starship program, 
New activity at Florida's spaceports signals the company's intent to expand operations beyond its primary site at Starbase, Texas. A recently released animation highlights plans for two Starship launch towers at Space Launch Complex 37, SLC-37, a historic site with roots tracing back to the Apollo era. Building upon earlier static renders published on SpaceX's website, the new video introduces updated design elements, such as ship quick disconnect arms, that were absent from previous imagery. However, the animation remains conceptual, still missing key components, like the full-scale propellant tank farm. Meanwhile, demolition work has begun on-site to prepare for Starship infrastructure. SpaceX has outlined ambitious goals for the Florida location, projecting up to 76 launches per year from the two planned pads, along with associated landing zones. While full-scale construction is expected to unfold gradually, the company's long-term vision could significantly reshape the region. Public response to these developments has been mixed. The Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, recently concluded a series of public hearings as part of its draft environmental impact statement process, which will determine whether SpaceX receives approval to launch Starship from NASA's Kennedy Space Center on Florida's Space Coast. Held at KSC and nearby Cape Canaveral, the hearings gathered community input on potential impacts. While the FAA has assessed the risks to public safety and property as low, the proposed scale and frequency of Starship launches would represent a major shift for the area. According to the draft EIS, operations could result in more than 60 annual closures of Playa Linda Beach, part of the Canaveral National Seashore, as well as frequent airspace and maritime restrictions that might delay commercial flights by 40 minutes to two hours. Reactions varied. Some residents expressed concern about noise, accessibility, and environmental disruption. Others were more optimistic. Kelly San Antonio, an environmental scientist at Bethune-Cookman University, shared findings from her team's research on vegetation near active launch pads. Their data suggests that methane-fueled rockets like Starship may be less harmful to local ecosystems than traditional solid-fueled boosters. Surprisingly, the impact, while detectable, was on a smaller scale than the solid rocket engine vehicles, she noted. Honestly, a project as transformative as Starship will bring significant changes, some positive, others more challenging. But that's the nature of innovation. It reshapes landscapes, industries, and expectations.